Hello, hello, everybody. It is 7.04 p.m. Central Time on the 14th of December, 2020. It's Monday here in the United States. Hope you're doing well. This is a somewhat impromptu update. I've got the cat in here with me, so I might have to break off and let her in or out of the room. Well, she's out right now, but she'll be back in soon. But we're not here to talk about feline issues, are we? We're here to talk about seismic events. And it's been two days since I've really done my last full update. So let's just go ahead and get her done. Let's turn on a display capture here. And just quickly explain, we're using Earthquake 3D, the program. I don't get anything for recommending it. I do have to say that just because some people think that I might get some kind of kickback for recommending it or something. No, I'm not affiliated at all, guys. I use it just like you do. You can get a paid version or a free version. The paid version allows you to combine feeds. And we've combined the USGS and the European EMSC feeds. We're looking at 48 hours worth of activity and the earthquakes that are high off the globe are what we consider deep earthquakes. The higher they are off the planet, the deeper they are into the earth. And just for perspective, these earthquakes here that are raised high off the globe, about 400 or so kilometers down below the plates in an area of semi-melted magma called the asthenosphere, which is just a complex word for it, the semi-melted magma down below the plate. So, we have deep earthquakes that have popped off in the last day. And just really quick, on the map here, we have letter Ds, where we watch for new deep earthquakes to strike as forecast points. And just take a quick look. Past two days, a series of new deep earthquakes have hammered off from New Zealand all the way up to our letter D at Fiji here, with a series of 4 and 5.0 earthquakes that are deep down below the plate. We watch for shallower, larger earthquakes to come up from these deep earthquake points. Now, the spots which are being struck spread out equally across the area from, for instance, in the Bay of Plenty, North New Zealand. We call that the catcher's mitt position. It kind of looks like a catcher's mitt. There's a volcano right in the middle of what is that catcher's mitt shape, or the Bay of Plenty, called White Island. Down to the south, we have a 4.2 on the plate boundary and the plate boundary is something I'm going to reference for the rest of this update and it's shown on the USGS map here marked in red lines between the different plates but I'm talking about the Pacific plate boundary in this case going down across across the center of New Zealand and then dead ending down to the south north of Antarctica on that stair step fracture zone now the deep earthquakes are hammering up to the north side right at the pinnacle tip next to Fiji so just looking at it this way going down across New Zealand, a series of same-sized earthquakes, 4.2 and 4.2. Going to the north, they get larger, and in the middle of the whole bunch, we have a series of fives breaking out up to mid-range five. Going to the west, we have a 4.6, 4.9, 5.2, 5.0. This is all in the past two days. In the past day, just the 5.2. Take a look at where the 5.2 is in relation to the other sets of earthquakes to the east and to the west. Wouldn't you say that's the halfway point between the two sets of earthquakes on either side in the past day? And especially if we look at the red lines of the plate boundary, the halfway point between over here and over here, if we go around the bends of the plate, perfectly puts us right here in the middle, in the middle where the 5.2 is. Over to the west, another 5.2, and look where it is. It is sandwiched, too, between two sets of earthquakes, but this is a much smaller area. Instead of thousands of miles across, we're only a few hundred miles across, maybe 500 to maybe 800 miles across right here, where the middle point is struck by another 5.2, with threes and fours on either side. Like a magical number, another 5.1 to 5.2 struck down here next to our letter X, and we have a fracture zone. You see which way it goes. It goes back up to our arrow. The arrow is really just mimicking on the Indo-Australian plate boundary that goes up to the north and meets up with our other arrow tip west of Sumatra. So we have the same sized energy spreading out to our letter X down here, but I can show you on the USGS map down here you see the stair step fracture zone, but you don't see any arrow or anything across this whole region. There's a straight line, a ridge, the Indo-Australian plate boundary, this which was struck by two mid-range 8.0 earthquakes in, I think it was 2012? Maybe it was 2011. It was after the Great Japan Earthquake with the tsunamis. There were two mid-range 8s that struck along this line, back-to-back -back in the same day, a few hours apart. 
So that was huge. Right now it's in the five range, so I would call that way low in comparison to where we could go. Of course, we've seen it go up into, like I said, the eight range. But that was at a time of high solar activity. A lot of X-class flare activity, I think, at the end of 2011 going into 2012. Okay, so going across over into Asia. Take a look at this. Let me get this turned on. Okay, well, maybe not. Okay, there we go. Right, <laughs> wrong button I pressed. That Working with this new button press peg. Sorry, guys. Going up across Myanmar over to the west, you see it's a red line again. That's the plate boundary between Asia and the Indo-Australian plate. Again, the Indo-Australian plate is huge. Look at it. It makes a crescent shape and goes back down across this area. So on the north side of it, a series of earthquakes struck this past week. Now, this earthquake right in the middle, there's something at this location in China. And I don't normally look up many earthquakes in Asia or across the rest of the area. But when I look this one up, again, I have to show you because a picture speaks a thousand words. This is why I look up earthquakes, even in remote locations in China. Wait do you see what's here. Get a load of that. Now, the earthquake is a few kilometers down in the crust, but we're down below a large energy production facility. This is coal, apparently. And then right next to it, we have a huge petroleum storage location, which has a place mark on it, which is called the China National Petroleum Corporation on this side with all those storage containers. Then here, of course, right in the middle of all of it, we have electrical generating turbines. It also looks like they're generating their own power here to power all of this on top of maybe possibly using this to create more power for the area. Usually that's what you have when you have a cooling tower like that. Now, that's pretty interesting to have an earthquake down below that, wouldn't you say? Of all the places, right? I mean, it's right there. I mean, that's the epicenter for the earthquake, right below it. Now, there was another 4.7 that struck back up here to the east-northeast in Siberia. Let's see if it's still on the feed. There it is. So really, it's two 4.7s. And there was a third 4.7 that struck down here at Iran. So wait a second, that's like a path or a trajectory of the same sized earthquakes going across the area, equally spaced across the whole region from Iran back across over into Lake Baikal in Siberia. And you could arguably say that the same sized earthquakes went the other direction, only, well, it was 4.6s instead of 4.7s. So across Russia and China, it was 4.7s. And over to the east across Alaska, it was all 4.6s. 4.6, 4.5, 4.6, 4.5. And this way is 4.7, 4.7, 4.7. And let me show it to you on the plate boundary map here from the USGS. They have nothing across Russia or China. Our arrows go right across, indicating that's the way we expect the force to flow from over here. And it is. The force is flowing from over here at the Pacific across Mongolia, going down across over at the north tip of the plate boundary north of India. It's also going the other direction, like I told you, across the other red line, which is marked by the USGS here, the plate boundary. But like I said, they don't have anything going across the center of the plate here while we have our arrows. And the arrows point the trajectory that the energy took all the way down back to where the USGS has a mark down here in South Iran, where the red line is here. That matches where the earthquakes went down to. So they went across the plate and accumulated here in Iran on the plate boundary. Since then, the whitish colored earthquakes have struck. So right here, 4.7 and a series of twos and threes breaking out right at the border of Turkey and Iran. Let me show you what resides at the border of Turkey and Iran. See the red line? Once again, I told you I was gonna be talking about the red line for the rest of the update. These plate boundaries are where the force flows across and it accumulated here, right where the two plate boundaries come together. Now there's a W shape here that goes up into Italy and all the way out to the Azores. Well, let me show it to you here on the earthquake map. And you will see it. A spread of twos and threes, but mainly threes back down on the south and twos going across the plate, but it's mimicking the edge of the plate boundary. Going up across Italy, back down across Gibraltar, the only thing we're missing is a new earthquake out here at our letter X, which, if you compare to the plate boundary map, is the dead end or the tail end, the T intersection 
for the force to flow to out here to the Azores. So far, energy has come in through Turkey, gone across the plate boundary south in the Mediterranean, gone up into Italy, back across instead of going across Algeria. It's come down. You see how the USGS has nothing there? We'll go over to my map, take a look. We have an arrow there indicating that when force is great enough, it comes up into Italy, and it will go back down across the Pyrenees and try to escape out to the west-southwest. Same time, energy will go across up to the north and build at the English Channel till we get a break. I would expect something pretty significant here, maybe in the upper three to low four range to break out in the English Channel at any moment, I would say probably in the next 24 to 48 hours, because look, a new 5.8 to near 6.0 earthquake struck east-northeast of Yan Mayan Island, the little tiny island here, right at the back side of our arrow tip. Now you see the big fracture there, that's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge fracture zone, and it goes back down across over into Iceland where the letter X is. Now if you'll notice where that X is, and you notice where this X is, all the way at the North Pole on the Gackle Ridge next to Mount Dutch Supervolcano. And here in the middle, Let's show it to you on the USGS map. Now all of a sudden you see the red line again. But you see nothing across Europe, right? Let's go show you what we have across Europe. First of all, I guess I need to turn off all the earthquakes. You see the S-shaped bend of the arrows again that are really just mimicking the outside edge of the plate. And that's the way we expect force to flow. So far, energy has reached all the way up here, indicating that we're saturated with 5.8 up here to the north. And then going back down to the south, just threes have struck across Poland and Romania. No break in between here and back down here, meaning energy went around the outside edge of Europe. But that means all of Europe is charged right now. Another way to look at this, this 5.8 out up here up on the North Pole and everything back down to Turkey where it's swarming, going back over to the west. The middle point between them all at this point is Poland. So on the edge of the arrow, if we come back down and around, if this is our southern point and this is our northern point, the middle point in between is under stress. So we have to warn the people in Northeast Europe near Poland of all places. So how big? I would put it less than the 5.8 since that's the full amount that's gone across the plate. I'd put it at the mid-range five level, which is pretty rare for Poland. So 5 to mid-range 5, a 5.5 topping out. It's not every day I have to issue a warning for Poland. Okay, so back across all the way over. Again, we have deep earthquakes that are hammering in on the underside of the plate, going all the way as far north as Japan. Another set of moderately deep earthquakes. I mean, they're not exactly majorly deep, but we're over 200 km. I look at anything 200 kilometers or more deep as a deep earthquake. This one's a 4.5, the other one's at 178 kilometers deep, almost 200. The reason I look at 200, that's about on average. There's some spots where the plate's much thicker, and there's other spots where the plate is much thinner. But on average, I'd say at about 200, we're starting to get down to the bottom of the plate or the underside. So, deep earthquakes in Alaska, deep earthquakes in Japan, deep earthquakes back down here in Indonesia, deep earthquakes back across over into Fiji and Tonga. All of a sudden, again, we went from just a few deep earthquakes, which, I mean, they were ha continually hammering off, but the solar event hit. Now, four days ago, and it, I told you guys, about two to three days after arrival of the solar storm, that's when we watch for the seismic. First, the deep earthquakes, then the shallower, larger earthquakes. Okay, now, the biggest earthquake of the day, a six has struck down here at South America, and it's right next to our warned area. North Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, South Peru, right in the middle of the plate. Down to the south, a series of fours, and I actually need to go check and see what the Volcanic Ash Advisory Center is showing. So let's go see that. And I'm just gonna look for any new additions. If you're a new viewer, really quick, I could read the names to you, but they're gonna be uh, spots you probably don't know where they are. Fuego, Reventador, Ducono, Sanjay, Popocatépetl. These are all our usual suspect volcanoes on the list. I'm not seeing anything majorly large except for one new addition that's not normally on the list, and that's Mount Etna, down in South Italy. 
Normally it's lava flows and a few small blasts, but I think it went up to 16,000 feet, which is pretty big. Now, I also don't know about this one, the unknown. <clears throat> Darwin has assumed responsibility for issuing volcanic ash advisories to the Wellington area. I, again, I, we don't normally get those put across the feeds, so that's pretty interesting, but I, again, I don't know what to make of that. Mount Etna, though, 14,000, 16,000 feet. Those are pretty big blasts for Italy. So just really quick, let me show you where Mount Etna is, where the rest are. So over here, Italy, Mount Etna, right down at the island of Sicily. And we were looking at this just the other day. A series of earthquakes were striking down here, and we pulled in right next to Mount Etna. I looked it up, pulled up the volcanoes there, even did a street-level view. This was just like two days ago. So there you go, that's Mount Etna. Now we go back all the way over here, and we have Mount Dukono and Mount Ibu. They're side-by-side side here in Indonesia. The rest of Indonesia has gone quiet volcanically. A week and a half, two weeks ago, two 50,000-foot-high blasts happened right here, right in the middle south portion of Indonesia. So to go from that down to two small blasts, it's gone quiet volcanically here across the area that just blew its top a week ago. That's a big drop-off, but it's a temporary drop-off. Like I said, 5.2 was the magic number. Look, 5.2, 5.2, down here 5.1 to 5.2, over here 5.2. So it's all 5.2s around all of Indonesia in the last 48 hours. Here's the way I want you to look at this. Between the letter X and all the way back over to eastern Papua New Guinea, how much energy do you think it would take to displace the whole region on a 5.2 basis in a day, basically? A lot. So those two volcanoes in the middle here are the ones that dropped off. Everything else dropped off around it. I'm going to say we need to watch for a new seismic in the middle where the volcanoes dropped off. Now the rest of the volcanoes that are on the list, Suwanizajima and Sakurajima, for instance, here in South Japan, Kyushu, all the way to the north, Kluchetskoy was erupting over the past few days, and also Kerensky volcano erupted over the past few days. But those two are gone now, or at least since last night. An Epico volcano also fell off the feed. So that's a silence up to the north. Meanwhile, as the volcanoes went silent up to the north, a spread went over across the Aleutian Island chain, all in the 4.6 basis. Like I said, 4.6, 4.6, 4.5. Once we get over to the coast, go into land, we take a step down from 4s to 3s to 2s, like jumping off a ramp and losing some energy as we fly through the air. So you can see where the energy went to. It went past Mount Denali, where our deeper earthquake struck, and dead-ended into the edge of the Craton, up in the Pacific Northwest, well, actually the far Northwest, far beyond the Pacific Northwest in the U.S. Whoops, wrong button, there we go. So the predominance of the activity went up into the plate and dead-ended into the edge of the plate. Now, same thing going on down to the south, going across Central America. Energy goes into the plate, dead ends into the plate, and tries to go across it. Now, I got contacted by a lot of different people about this 4.2, asking me if this was the earthquake we're looking for. No, technically, no. Not just technically. No, that's not the earthquake we're looking for. We're looking for something over here on the east side of the Caribbean, from Venezuela up here all the way to the edge of the plate boundary. You can see it. It's pretty obvious. It looks like a flowing over point, and it is. It's like 20,000 feet higher in the Caribbean than it is over here in the Atlantic. But a new 4.2 striking here on the edge of the plate boundary in Dominican Republic just indicates that energy is coming across like we expect. It's not that big for 4.2. It's enough to get your attention, but it's going over to the east, and I'm sorry if I keep moving the microphone. It keeps slightly falling down. It's making a little sagging sound. <laughs> okay, a real professional again. Now let's go back over along the coast because the only other volcanoes that are on the list are mentioned right here at Guatemala. That's Fuego Volcano. And up in Mexico, Popocate Patal. But that's a huge drop-off too across Central America. We had Teleco going. We had big blast at Fuego and Santa Guido. But now Fuego's just on the list. South America, the number of volcanoes has fallen off too. We had Nevado del Ruiz volcano erupting here in Colombia. 
we had Sanjay and Reventador both erupting here in Ecuador, and then Sabancaya was going down here at South Peru, and Nevado de Chilean was going down here to the south in Chile. So those are also off the list. But while those are off the list, a new 4.5 is coming across, coming down the stair step fracture zone. It's coming across from all the way over here. Energy is transferring across the plate, aided by the fracture zones in the plate, which are stair step shaped. You can see them here, of course. And we can go over to the USGS plate boundary map if we really needed to, to show them to you going across the Pacific, what happens down here across the Southeast Pacific. I'll get to California in a minute. I, I am aware of four point something struck in California again, or right at the California Nevada border. But going across over to the east, you see the fracture zones and the plate boundaries, the red lines again. And we're going to get into that in the United States because the red line, look where it goes. It's the San Andreas. It goes right across the coast, of course. But it meets up down here where we're getting the same sized earthquakes. Mid-range fours, upper fours, low fives with one six mixed right into the middle of the whole hot mess. Now that brings me to the United States. We had 5.0 activity come in this past week. And that was pretty significant. Got everybody's attention. They took it down to a 4.9. Let me just get a sip of my little hot drink while we're thinking about that. So a new 4 has struck out here. Let's just go see where we are. Well, zooming in, first of all, you'll see the previous earthquake, the 4. Point, what was it? 4.9 or 4.8? That's hard to tell at this point, but now they have it at 4.8. So let's just pull the coordinates on this, see where it is. The Europeans, I'm sorry, the Europeans have it at a 4.8. What does the USGS have it as? Well, they have it as a 4.7, of course. You know, always got to be different kind of group there. But we'll pull the coordinates. They're not in the exact same spot as we were last time. We shifted by a few miles. Now, you may remember previously in California, right at the border, or in Nevada, right at the California border, we were actually at a volcano and an old strip mine of some kind. So look where we are now. First of all, in perspective, here's the old volcano. Here's the old strip mines on both sides of the volcano. And lava flow there. And now we're over to the west. So we have progressed. Let me take you back in time. Six months ago, a 6.5 earthquake struck here at Monte Cristo Hills Volcanic Center huge earthquake. A surface fissure fracture formed, and it was 12 miles long, going roughly east to west. They measured it. There were pictures taken of it. You guys can find that online. So the fissure spread, and the fissure actually spread towards the California border, really, west to east. Over on the California side of the border over here, we have Long Valley Caldera, the super volcano, with a thousand cubic kilometers of meltdown below. Now the new earthquake, the new five that struck in the past week, struck, or two weeks ago, struck right here, next to this old lava flow, which I don't even have a name on, and the old pit mine that's right next to it. And I say old because it doesn't look like it's in use anymore. You see how the rocks have collapsed in on the sides where you would drive a truck down? I mean, there might be a way to get down in there and it might not be fully out of use, but it sure doesn't look like it's well maintained. But now we're over to the west of there. But look what we have. We have more old cinders of ancient origin, most likely in maybe the millions of years old by their time scale, of course. I would say that we've spread from the fissure point over to the west to the break points in the surface that humans created, and we're carrying on spreading. The energy is spreading. The fracture is breaking. That's why we have another near 5.0 earthquake, almost 5, 4.7, whatever. And it spread over to the west some more. So how far west are we going to spread? We started here. We spread over to here. Now we spread over to here. What's the distance on that? I actually would like to get a measurement on that, just so I can know from the future. So just starting right at the center of Monte Cristo. We'll go due west over to Coaldale. Or almost due west. North by northwest. 18 miles to the quarries. And then we go an additional... Three miles. Now we're 20 miles long. And we're spreading in the relative direction, actually, of Aurora Bodhi Crater. If that we keep that trajectory up, we're going to be more at Aurora Bodhi Crater. Somewhere up here. 
or the edge of Mono Lake, then we would be spreading down to the super volcano at that point, if we carry on up that direction. But so far, it's gone 20 miles, and the direction is pretty obvious. It's from west to east or east to west. Let me show you what we have here. Look what we have over here to the east. West to east, east to west. This arrow's been on here for years. It's the way we watch for energy to flow. I've even had it on the Craton diagram for God knows how long. So a new mid-range 4. That's not all that struck. It's just the biggest earthquake. It's just got everybody's attention again. Now, just go back in time a couple days, and there was another mid-range Doppler 4, 4.9. And go back a few days before that, and there was another 5. So it's like 5, 4, 4, 5. And it's going to keep hammering off, and the plate is going to continue to shift. Now, there's also some other shifting going on. For instance, up to the north. Take a look at it this way. All the way up at the Idaho border, we have a 3.6. Let's just call that an upper 3 with a little swarm breaking out. But it's not in Idaho this time. Let me turn down the ring so you can see where it is. It's really on the outside skirts of Yellowstone. Yellowstone National Park is here at the Wyoming border. And you can exit the park, go over to Montana, go down into Idaho. It's all right there. But this is right on the edge of the Craton. Look at the Craton edge out of Idaho going down into Wyoming, going across the park. The Craton edge goes right across the edge of the park. It's not a coincidence. The supervolcano is right on the seam or the edge of the deformed craton, the purple portion, where it meets up with the brownish, orangish color portion. The other supervolcano over at the California border formed at the purple portion where it meets the purple versus green. Over at the Nevada border. Amazing, right? Our, two of our supervolcanoes have formed at seams across the deformed craton where it meets up with two spots. So this new outbreak, this new swarm, let's go look what's there. Let's just go see. 3.6. We could get the coordinates from either the USGS or the EMSE since they're both coming to the same conclusion on magnitudes. Actually, hold on. They've upgraded the earthquake. What the heck? Man, somebody's feeling generous tonight. Tis the season. They must have put up some Christmas decorations in the USGS offices. They're feeling generous tonight. 3.7. Okay, uh, <laughs> what do we have here? Okay, well, looking in at the area, you'll see a bunch of other marked volcanoes. Sorry, guys. Marked volcanoes down to the south. South and north, Juniper's Volcanic Buttes. Menon Buttes. The Menon Buttes here. Hold on. North and south Menon Buttes are too large. Two of the largest north to south lines of the basaltic tuff cones formed by, oh my gosh, how do you say this? Friato magmatic. Okay, that's steam created magma eruptions. So, phreatic blast. It would be an easier way to say it. steam blast. Magma hits water, steam boom. Friato magmatic. What is this, Commander Data? Freato magmatic blast, Captain. We're coming in from the warp coils. Well, you wouldn't say it like that, though. The phreatic blast. Are... Shut up, Data. Here we are. Yellowstone. We're right on the edge of Yellowstone. The magma chamber for Yellowstone starts at the surface. It goes down about 30 kilometers, and it spreads over to the west below central Idaho. And the feeder for the whole thing comes in from below Oregon. So it's... 11 Grand Canyons in total size, by the way. Most of it down below Idaho and western Wyoming, of course, but mainly in Idaho. So we're above the center part of the magma chamber, on the edge of the craton, no less, where our new swarm broke out. 3.6, bunch of 1s, 2s, and up to a near 4, basically. Meanwhile, a near 5 struck back down where I just showed you at the California-Nevada border at the other supervolcano. Long Valley, it's a confirmed supervolcano, 1,000 cubic kilometers of melt, right down below it. Let me show it to you one more time. Right here. This thing, supervolcano Long Valley. The earthquake, the new five, striking right across the border. The line of earthquakes going this way, right over to the border, which meets up with Mono Lake and Aurora Bodhi Crater. So if you're just now tuning in from California or the West Coast, another near five struck, and you probably felt it if you live in the area. So why is all this movement happening? The plate, the Pacific plate, 
is in a state of unrest because of other events that are taking place around the planet. And that has to do with the solar activity that came impacting into Earth now four days ago. And as I told you, four days ago when it came impacting on the 10th, to wait two to three days for the impact to have a deep earthquake and a shallower, larger earthquake effect. And that we'll see a big outbreak go from next to nothing up to something major, number of earthquake-wise, and magnitudes at each location around the planet is going to see an increase as this translation takes place. So it goes from the poles, where the solar storm impacts on the North Pole and South Pole, for instance, but all over the planet, gets taken down into the crust, then down to the core of the Earth, then comes back up via deep earthquakes, and then the spread of shallower, larger earthquakes starts almost instantly. I haven't even talked about Hawaii, but Hawaii had a new four here in the volcanic location that we were previously talking about next to Mauna Loa. Again, Kilauea, Mauna Loa, but we'll get into Hawaii in a moment. Now, I'm going to turn on the last 24 hours worth of earthquakes. This is just the buildup, guys. I'm telling you, we're going through it now. We were waiting for the increase to hit. The increase now has taken place with the deep earthquakes now starting to hammer off. And the number of earthquakes starting to go up again. I used the analogy two days ago in my last update of a surfer. And I talked about we're between waves. So... If you're a surfer or you've ever ridden on any kind of ocean waves, you can get to that point where you're at a low point and there's not much swell activity, but you're expecting it from a storm or a tide or where, like in some cases some rogue waves even can be predicted. That just like that, we're at a low point and we're going to go up really quick to a high point. And now here we are. We're starting to quickly go up. In the last 24 hours, the whitish colored earthquake struck here along the west coast. This is the last 24 hours worth of activity from the USGS. And let me hit refresh just to make sure we have the most current. Looks like a hodgepodge, but really quick, I'll explain it to you if you've never seen this before. We have two areas really in California that are shifting. One along the coast, which are signified by the pinkish colored earthquakes, and one along the California-Nevada border, which have pinkish and whitish colored earthquakes. Down to the south, we're kind of mixed between the two. We have pinkish and whitish colored earthquakes mixed in together. So in other words, the pinkish colored earthquakes and the reddish are from yesterday or last night over the last 24 hours. They're the older earthquakes of the day. And the areas that are moving now are represented in white and a, kind of a light pink color there. Okay, why am I showing that to you? Because last night we moved along the coast, going into this morning. Up here to the north, down to the south, mid-range 2 level. 2.4 here along the creeping section of the San Andreas. Parkfield, California, by the way. And down here to the south at... North LA, or next to Ventura, or Ojai, California. Then, around the same time, earthquakes over to the east, along the California-Nevada border, started to pick up in the number of earthquakes, but not the magnitudes. So we started to see an increase in the number of zeros and ones and twos take place. That We call that a frequency increase, by the way. Now, you can trace these earthquakes back, like a connect the dots, in a diagonal line pointing back up to the west by northwest. And there's a connection between them. I, you don't just magically draw a line between them. You can go and look on the USGS map, and you can trace that line here across the Nevada border, following the faults. So going back up across, you see how they all go in roughly the same direction. Once they get to central Nevada, then we branch out and go over to the east. But northwest, southeast, or southeast to northwest, nonetheless, most of the faults are taking that shape. And that's the trajectory the earthquakes took back up all the way up to here. So it all points back up to Oregon, where there's no earthquakes reported again today. Again, today. Now, there was a three yesterday reported off the coast. How ironic. It's almost like somebody's listening to my updates or something. But again, another day where there's no significant sized earthquakes at all, not even a small earthquake of any significant size, reported out of Oregon. It, it, it's just so odd. Now, up to the north, well, wow, it's like somebody hit the off switch for Washington State, too. Let's go see where this lone earthquake is. Ashford, Washington. Looks like it's on top of some kind of mountain or something. Surely the USGS would tell us if it was at some significant spot that was worth noting. Even if it's a small earthquake, I mean. But I don't know where it's coming in. Oh, that's right. 
It's coming in right below the crater for Mount Rainier. So why not just list it as Mount Rainier? You know, I hope someday that their triangulating coordinates or whatever they use, that the computer triangulates the coordinates and then it also lists nearby volcanic features of, of interest. Because everybody who's watching, if you didn't know what was right there at that little brown splotch on the map, or if you go over to the USGS map, it's just a white map. You turn on the topography, it might not even tell you. It's, it's right below the crater of Mount Rainier. It's just a small earthquake, but it's worth paying attention to. Why? Because a small earthquake is a small fracture above a magma chamber for a rising volcano. Why would a volcano have a sm slight earthquake at it rising? Maybe the same reason we'd have a earthquake above the magma chamber for Yellowstone that comes up on the edge of the craton over to the east. Maybe for the same reason we'd have earthquakes down here at Mena, Nevada, next to the other supervolcano at the California-Nevada border. Maybe it would help to pay attention to the small earthquakes at Mount Rainier, for instance, and to notify everyone in the general public that the earthquake is there. Don't be alarmed. It doesn't mean any eruption. Maybe that's why they don't do it. You know what? I bet. I bet. I've got a sneaking suspicion that that might be why they're not doing it to begin with. What do you think? Hey, let me get another sip of my drink here. Don't worry, kids. We're not drinking anything that's going to make me feel of an altered consciousness. Okay. <laughs> Let's go down to the south into Northern California. And like I said, this stepping stone path of earthquakes pretty much lines up with the direction or shape the faults are taking. And if we go look up each location, there's something at each location, or most of them, to lead to the cause of the earthquake. It's not just randomly striking across the area where there's a fault. Let me just go ahead and show you. Okay, Chester, California, for instance. Perfect spot to start. Pull the coordinates, put them in, go see what's there. And I encourage you guys to do this, by the way. You, you should look up the earthquakes, even if they're small. Look where we are. Look, it's a spread of volcanoes, and I'll zoom in on some of the nearby cones, but Mount Harkness Volcano is here. Mount Harkness, pretty interesting. Bonte Peak. Look at the tuftage on top of that. That's pretty interesting. It doesn't really look like a volcano even, does it? Black Cinder Volcano. Well, that's a little... The name, I guess, kind of speaks for itself. Again, these are so old. I mean, to call these vol... I, I don't think these will erupt again. Oh, wow. Red Cinder, Black Cinder, Ash Butte. All of these. Okay, we're right next to them. We're right in the middle of a volcanic field. Now, really, we're right next to Mount Lassen, which is the greater stratovolcano. This is the Lassen Volcanic Center, I believe. But the closest volcano right next to it. Here's the closest Smithsonian marked. So, closest Smithsonian marked is this. Sifford Mountain, a basaltic to andesitic shield volcano, rises in south-central Lassen National Park. Active in the last 100,000 years. You gotta say it like that for dramatic effect, guys. Come on. So if we go east by southeast from the spot that I just looked up, start equally spacing these earthquakes out, we get right down into here between Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake. That's where the other two earthquakes reside, between Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake. One on the Nevada side of the border and one on the California side of the border. Now let me show you what's between Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake if you're new. If you're a longtime viewer, it's just another day at the office, guys, right? You're like, oh, yeah, this earthquake forecasting thing is getting a little old. Oh, yeah, yeah, knowing where the earthquakes are striking is a little uh, boring at this point, Dutch. Yeah, okay, guys, I get you. But I got to show all the new people, so take a look, all right? Right here in the middle of the screen, in between Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake, we have an oval shape. Now, that oval shape is lined with volcanoes, old volcanoes. Let me turn the volcano place marks back on. Now, to the south, Lake Tahoe. Deep fold in the plate, a basin. On the north side, another deep fold in the plate, and that's Pyramid Lake. On both sides of the oval shape. On the south side, we have a volcanic field called Steamboat Springs. 
it's a geothermal fumarole field geyser field that they drilled into to get steam to make those turbines turn to provide electric to the area now on the north side up here at pyramid lake they have the same thing fumarole fields and geyser fields but and old volcanoes there but these have not been exploited it's on an indian reservation or right next to it and they haven't gone into there but equally spaced on both sides of the giant oval shape we have geothermal fields and then equally spaced on both sides we have basins around the outside edge we have volcanoes and guess what earthquakes go around the outside edge and right into the middle of this thing and now we're going to turn our borders and labels back on there's the border going right through the middle of the oval shape now let's go back and compare to the earthquakes the border right through the middle of the oval on both sides of the oval we have two sets of quakes this is something that we've seen happen for years since i've been live streaming and i first started to notice this oval thing maybe nine years ago eight or nine years ago i was about a year into my updates started to talk about this thing now the weirdest thing started to happen in the past few years a series of fires broke out inside of here and around the outside edge big fires too not small ones they tried to blame it on lightning people were there were saying it looked like the lightning of course was coming out of the ground which we know it does but might have been due to something else they tried to also blame power lines okay so carrying on I think I just proved it to you though we start up here right in the middle of a volcanic field Mount Harkness and we go down on both sides of our oval shape then we carry on down to Monte Cristo Hills Volcanic Center with its east to west facing earthquakes that have spread out on the back side of our arrow same time that's going on a series of smaller earthquakes but just a trickle out has gone down past the super volcano and the flow down to Ridgecrest is numbering in maybe 20 different earthquakes maybe tops the highest going to 2.0 so the flow coming out of here has been cut off as it's all striking here right now now look which way the arrow points over to Utah over to Colorado down to Texas all the way over across over to the far east coast following the edge of the Craton now as we follow the edge of the Craton we expect an increase to take place going from here where the new near five has struck in two directions one down to the south two or actually one over to the east two down to the south I would expect most of the energy to try to travel over on the edge of the Craton and we'll see an increase number of earthquake wise and magnitudes to go up by two fold or a hundred fold increase in power we're going to go from twos up to fours most likely off this so get ready in Southern Colorado it could go up and I hope I'm right on this if I'm wrong it could go even bigger but it should go up to in the fours in Southern Colorado at Trinidad and then down to the south we should go threes across Texas and a new four here striking in Oklahoma as well so it should actually be two fours I'm sorry one in Colorado one in Oklahoma and a three down in Texas at the western portion near southwest of Amarillo or down near Fort Stockton as if that wasn't all enough Southern California should now get hit we should see a new earthquake come in between our current sets of quakes and we have two sets of quakes one coming in from the north the other down to the south the big spread going across the Elsinore and the San Jacinto down to south of Salton Sea and I have to warn pretty much a 200 mile stretch 200 miles pretty much covers all the way down to the coast but I'll warn right in the middle of it all that's the LA Basin now we can further winnow this down ever so slightly I think by pulling the coordinates here at Fillmore and then look down to the south and see where our quakes pick back up on the San Andreas find the halfway point between the two that should be our spot to break but I'm looking within 200 miles that puts us even out to the Mojave Desert if I'm wrong on this it I don't think so though I think we're gonna see some activity break out here okay uh well okay, well, of course we're right next to where the fires took place over Castaic Lake of all places we have an oil pumping operation just to the south I don't know how far north it goes let's just go take a look well I'd say it goes pretty far north look how many are at this one pad alone one two three four five different drill points just on that pad look we have five here too one two three four five that's ten drill points just on this hilltop 
and it goes all the way down. Here, let me zoom in on one of the oil wells so we can get a good shadow on it so you can see what I'm talking about. There we go. There's your famous oil well shape, the jack or the pump, the shadow of the jack or the pump. Okay, we're right next to it. I mean, we're just a matter of miles. I don't know how far north we go with the pumping ops, but it looks like we go at least as far north as here. Yeah? There's some. What about further up to the north? Is this one? Or is that a turnaround point? No, we got a well there too. No, that's not a well. That's a turnaround point. All right, so we're a matter of about five miles. <laughs> Let's see. Let's measure from the earthquake epicenter down to the pad. Two miles, 2.5 miles. I always look six to 10 miles. So if we're within two miles, that's definitely related to the pumping operation. But there's something else there, as if that isn't enough. A drilling right there. But down here to the south, look where we are. We're on the fault. They've drilled on the fault. And the fault goes down to the San Gabriel Fault. Connects down to the south. You see it makes like a lightning bolt shape. Connects into the Sierra Madre, and then further down to the south to the San Jacinto, where they meet up with the thick red line, which is the San Andreas. So I've already issued the warning for LA, for the LA Basin, and I'm warning on the north side. I talked about this two days ago, so nothing's changed. North side of LA, and let me show it to you on the plate boundary map here. See the thick red line there? I'm warning right between our sets of quakes, on the thick red line, north of the LA Basin. Size earthquakes should go maybe even into the 5-ish range. I'll put it at 4.9 right now, just to be safe. And I hope I'm wrong completely, but LA should feel that. Now, 200 miles, let's just measure 200 miles and show you how far 200 miles is, just for perspective from where I'm warning. I try to get it down to a 200-mile stretch in either direction. Not a 400-mile total, I'm looking 200 miles either direction. So if I'm warning right here, there's 200, Salton Sea, basically. Or, well, I mean, Westmoreland. 200 down to Westmoreland. We're 200 back to the border, basically. 160, 170 back to the border. And we're 200 back up to the creeping section of the San Andreas. But I'm looking here, in this area. So I will technically accept if it hits anywhere from up to here down to here, but the middle worn point, the LA Basin on the San Andreas, is where we should watch. So I would look in this vicinity for the big release to take place, and it should be into the 5-ish range, just based upon, or something close to it, 4.9, based upon what's going on along the border. Finally, we get down to Southern California. We have one quake, which is actually an explosion out in the Mojave Desert. Here, let me make sure on that. Hold on. Quarry Blast, Boron, California. Kind of tells you what's there, right? It's not Boreen, it's Boron. And then down to the south, we have a series of small earthquakes. But the number of earthquakes here is low. We call this a low frequency. So if you were had a drum, the snare roll was going really fast. It's now down to just a few hits of the drum. We've seen this go up into the hundreds, if not thousands of earthquakes in a day, just across this area. So to get this low amount is, again, a sign that the flow has been cut off. And we know it's been cut off because it's striking up here where it's been cut off. But it's going to let go. It's going to let go out over to the east, Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas. It's also going to cut out and let it go down to the south, down into the L.A. Basin. Now, where's it all coming from? It's all coming from the spot where we don't have any earthquakes reported. <laughs> okay. So let's go take a look and see if we have any tremors being reported. Since there's no earthquakes being reported, are there any vibrations as the plate would be shifting, maybe? Anyone? Anyone? 69 different little vibrations as the plate is shifting, and they're happening in Oregon and Northern California. Let's go back a day to the 13th. 157. There's a cluster up at the Olympic Peninsula, the Puget Sound, Washington. Two clusters in Oregon, across central Oregon, and one cluster in northern California. So what's the difference? We went from there, now watch, to today. The northern spot stopped shifting. No earthquakes up north. No shifting up north. It's locked. Now meanwhile, over to the east, right on the edge of the craton. Whoa. Whoa. Hey. 
Hey there. Come here. Come on up. Is it feeding time? Oh, she just went. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on up. You want to get on my lap? Or are you chilling? All right, guys. It might be time to wrap it up. Usually that's a supernatural sign of time to wrap it up. Right, Wednesday? So, really quick, let's just sum it all up. The plate has stopped shifting on the north side. No earthquakes. It's shifting on the south side. Meanwhile, as it shifts down to the south side, new 5.0 earthquake takes place at the California-Nevada border. Now, again, we expect this to flow across the craton. One direction over to the east, the other direction down to the south. Both directions are going to move. It's not like one area is going to shift over to the east and the other area just stays quiet. So, L.A. Basin up to the north, San Andreas, keep watch. Next three days, 72 hours. So, by the 17th, 15th, 16th, 17th. It's not even that long we have to wait. The earthquakes have already struck here, guys, at the California-Nevada border. So, the energy has already been introduced. I would expect the number of earthquakes to increase. That's a no-brainer. No I mean, the number of earthquakes should go up since we're so low right now. So, all these zeros and ones should see more of those. And then we should see that new larger earthquake pop off in between them. And that's on the north side of L.A., I believe. Hope I got that right. The tremors indicate shifting of the plate, still carrying on by a few hundred, maybe, at, at the most, per day. 69, 50, 100 little vibrations as the plate is shifting around up here on the north side on land. But the energy is coming in from here, guys, where the fracture zone is. It's a zigzag M-shaped fracture zone out there, the Juan de Fuca. And that's where the energy is coming from, from the Pacific plate. And that takes me back to the start of the update where I did mention Hawaii. Hawaii also went back up in the number of earthquakes and the magnitudes behind them. Did I say Mauna Loa? I meant to say Mauna Kea. Hold on. Let's go pull the coordinates. Um, I'm allowed a few errors per update, aren't I? I talk straight for an hour and a half. I'd like to see anybody else try to do that. Try to talk straight for an hour and a half in front of a live audience without saying um a lot or you know, or any slang terms that you would normally use. And try and do that while also looking up all the information and pronouncing all the names. Uh, you'll, you'll strike out on something at some point, guys. So here we are. We're on the side of Mauna Kea. Hey, hey I'm, I'm a geophysics nerd, and I'm also expected to be a social media guru. Isn't that expect <laughs> amazing expectations? Hate to let you down so much, guys. We're on the edge of a giant ancient volcano, which isn't supposed to erupt anytime soon. You know how I know that? This is where all the astronomers decided to build all of their telescopes. With the expectation that there's not many eruptions here that could affect the telescopes. So Mauna Kea is a giant volcano, but on the side is the biggest on the surface of the planet, not counting undersea volcanoes, but Mauna Loa. Now last week, 4 point something earthquake struck right here on the side of Mauna Loa. 4.1, 4.2. Now wait just one second. What's the size of this new earthquake? A 4.3. Now when that 4.2 struck this past week, let me get back over here and show you on the map. When it struck here, the day before the 4 struck, there was a swarm going on around this Kilauea in the Middle East Rift Zone. Going all the way down to the coast, back up across to the Middle East Rift Zone, the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. It was like a triangle of earthquakes around this area. Okay. So I got on and started talking about it, which then prompted, I think, the USGS to get on and talk about it. There was hubbub on social media because I was talking about it in my updates. And I, I'm not bragging or anything. I just have to tell you that's what was going on. So when that happened, they came out and said, well, it's just a swarm going up to near 3.0 doesn't really mean anything is really what they were saying. Don't worry, doesn't mean anything. The highest that's going is three. Then the next morning, after they issued that statement, the highest that's going is three. Doesn't look like anything significant. On the back side of this, Mauna Loa, that's where the 4.2 struck. Now we got another four, all the way up here on the north side of Mauna Kea. So that's really 
a significant amount of 4.0 activity suddenly at the two other volcanoes plus Kilauea. So what could cause two fours at two huge volcanoes back behind or on the side of or up above is a better term up above Kilauea. If Kilauea is reinflating, which we know it is, it's refilling up. This collapsed down by like 2,000 feet or 1,500 feet. This went boom and fell down. It fell down because this all drained out. There was a lava lake up in there and a tube that went down into the feeder for the magma chamber. And when the top collapsed, it pressed down on the magma, which then came out on the side over here and flowed out over at Bahoa and went down into the ocean, of course. So this all drained down and now it's refilling back up. But this is now smaller on the top. The whole thing collapsed all the way around it too. Not just the crater, but the whole caldera collapsed and everything around it for, I would say, maybe even a few miles around it started to deform maybe downwards overall. So for instance, this was not like this. This giant pit formed and collapsed in on itself. But now it's refilling, and the refilling is pushing back up on the underside of Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, since they're technically, again, I showed it to you from the side, they're up above it. And they've mounted up above it, of course, but the magma chambers, I think, too, maybe even are up above, or at least nestled alongside of the Middle East Rift Zone, which lies lower. Now, you could say maybe, that Mauna Loa's magma chamber goes down on the side of the Middle East Rift Zone, and Mauna Kea goes down on the side of Mauna Loa. So if this displaces, that's Kilauea, if the Middle East Rift Zone displaces upwards and outwards, refilling, then it would displace Mauna Loa, which would then displace Mauna Kea, and it would be a chain reaction effect of four to four to four to four around the island, the big island, but I don't think it would stop there then. I mean, we'll know in just a little bit if it goes back up here to Kahulawe and Halekalekala or Maui or Lanai. But I would look back up here now to see maybe just if it spreads. Or, or you know what? Hold on. Before we get a jump off the big island, Hualalai or Kohala. So maybe look between Hualalai, Kohala, Kahulawe, and Halekalekala. Is that? Wait. No, 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 dude, I can't even do this. Hold on, let me get a sip of my drink. I'm trying, guys. I'm from Missouri. You're asking a lot out of me. I mean, to be a geophysics guy and a linguistics expert? Come on. What do you expect me to be? Some TV talking head meteorologist who knows how to say everything the right way? Has a fact checker team that looks at everything for me before I get on live? I get the Duchess on that. Hey, babe. Okay. Kahulaway, we look between this. I would look for a new four to break out. And if it does, I'm, I'm not saying it's going to 100%, but if it does, then that means that the distribution that goes from Kilauea to Mauna Loa to Mauna Kea, it would go to Hualalai, Kohala, and Kahulaway. And if that happens, that's just proof that they're all connected. And if one shifts, they all shift in a line in succession of one another. So Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea, I would then look further to the north for this to spread. And that would indicate that the Middle East Rift Zone is getting to a point where it's really charging up and it's filling and it's pushing Mauna Loa, which is then pushing Mauna Kea, which then could push these up to the north. That's what I'll look for, but I'm not going to issue a forecast for it. I'm just going to watch myself and see what happens. Since this is the first time, I think, in 200 years that anything like this has happened, right? First time in 200 years that Kilauea fully collapses and drains out and has no magmatic contents coming up to the surface at all. It's been, it had a lava lake for a long time. Now it doesn't. It's all collapsed. I hope that's a sufficient update for everybody. Let's just really quickly check. Let's go turn back on the seven-day earthquake feed and see if there's anything else on. Any other earthquakes that have struck since starting the update. Sometimes... While I'm doing an update, we get a significant sized earthquake that shows up. <laughs> Let's just see. Okay, nothing going on right now. That's good. Like I said, that between wave point has been reached and 
We now have a bunch of deeper... I shouldn't say nothing going on right now. Nothing going on at this very second. But right now, we do have a bunch of deep earthquakes taking place where I want you to watch for shallower, larger earthquakes to pop off between our current sets of quakes. Looking at 48 hours, it's pretty easy to determine the big open silent zones between our current sets of quakes. So, for instance, here at the triangular bend of the Solomon Islands, right where the bending arrow is, between the 5.2 and the cluster of deep earthquakes, we got a watch there from New Caledonia all the way over to Solomon Island, where this is the middle point. Could break something big, bigger than what's on both sides right now if you add it all together. Same for down in New Zealand. I can't stress this enough. Look, this is where the populations really are. In New Zealand, look where the rings overlap. Here, let's get a straight overhead view on this. They overlap right at Wellington, south tip of the island, North Island, right where the arrows go across the center of the portion of New Zealand, Kaikoura. Now, the magnitude on this I would look for in the 5 range down near New Zealand. I hope I got that right. I think most of the energy is going to go over to the west, over to the Solomon Islands. Additionally, we have to watch Papua New Guinea yet again. For the next several days. This isn't just like a one or two day watch on these. This is the next seven to ten days based upon our deep earthquake activity when it starts. And it's starting in earnest as of today. Started hammering off. People started to notice it today. It wasn't just me. Okay, so we watch in between here and it's the same thing, only just a little bit smaller. I would look for something in the six-ish level, whereas over here I would look for something greater than all this combined, which also goes up to the 6.5 level. The deep earthquakes, I mean. Over to the west, quiet. Quiet, 48 hours across Java, western Java, all of Sumatra, all of Myanmar, all of Nepal, all of China, pretty much, going over to western, northwest China, where we have a new 4.1 that struck. I should go look that one up. Man, this update's just going to keep going on and on forever, because this one was below a coal mine. What, what about this one? I don't know, I'm curious, but first things first, this big open area between the two, if we go down around the bends of the arrow and back across into Indonesia, into Indonesia, we watch right here in the middle at the northwest tip of Sumatra, going as far north as Myanmar, but I would look even closer in the middle, going into the northwest tip of Sumatra, back end of the arrow. How big? It will be bigger than what's on both sides. We have fours on one side and mid-range fives on the other. But all of the Indo-Australian plate is shifting again which means we're due for upper 5 to low 6 level, striking right here in the middle. Just like the upper 5 that struck all the way across on the other side of the planet. So we're due for the same amount of energy to spread out in all directions. And I would look, again, for that 7.0 activity. Can't rule it out with the solar and all the deep earthquakes. But the 7s should strike if we're lucky on this. And that's a joke, by the way. We don't rely on luck. But... If we're lucky on this, it'll come in right next to the warned area in the middle of nowhere in the ocean. And if a 7 hits, it might generate a small wave or something, but not big enough to harm anybody or even really for anybody to even notice. That's what we hope for. Hope for the best. But plan for the worst. And the worst, of course, is 5.0 range or greater coming into Southern California. And I'm wrong on the magnitude. and It actually turns out to be a bigger earthquake or something. So I want you to be ready for that now. Look, I mean, what more do you need? The rest of the plate's moving. Hawaii's shifting. Deep earthquakes are coming up into Alaska, even. Deep earthquakes are spreading across three-quarters of the planet, or at least three-quarters of the Pacific plate. Fiji, Indonesia, Japan, Alaska, and South America. That we only are really missing one spot for deep earthquakes, and that's Central America, which... Look, I don't want to count this one from two days ago. That's too long ago, but... The only thing missing is one new deep earthquake right in there. And we'd have deep earthquakes all the way around the whole plate. Now the deep earthquakes are from the solar, and the solar disturbs the core of the Earth, which then sends VLF or ULF or ELF, very low, extremely low, or ultra-low frequency, up in a standing wave, I believe. And that's a belief on mine. I can't exactly prove that yet. But the equal spaced earthquakes kind of bear out that idea that the equal spaced earthquakes across huge distances, those huge distances are the perfect size for very low frequency. Thousands of miles across for the peak of the wave down to the trough or the bottom of the wave. Looking in on this 4.1 in China, the last one was right below a uh, coal station of some kind. So this one's out in the middle of nowhere, huh? Oh wait, 
Well, I don't think so at all. We're right below some kind of... What is this? That's not water. Those are some kind of huge tanks for petroleum, maybe? What the heck? Uh, that's what they are. I mean, they're for some kind of chemical storage of some kind. It's got pipelines going to it, so I'd think pipelines. Oil. Wouldn't you? Pipeline, oil, where do all these go? What, what is this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe liquefied natural gas. LNG. Natural gas oil. Natural gas field of some kind. Yeah. Look at all the pipelines connecting between them, guys. All right. Got a shadow of a... Looks like a gas well. That's a gas well. Maybe gas storage, too. They might be doing storage out there. Gas storage. They might have their own version of salt domes where they store some of this stuff. Aren't you glad I'm checking these now in China? Look, we get one at a gas storage field where they've drilled. We got another one back at a coal mine or some kind of giant power generating plant. But it's kilometers down in the crust, guys. That's two of them in a row right next to each other in the same trajectory following the arrows. That's why I go look them up. And I'm going to have to start doing that all the time now, even on the smaller earthquakes. In the United States, they're coming in next to power lines and power generating stations. Even in Japan, same thing. Coming in next to power generating stations on land. We got a, happened just the other day at a huge electrical substation in Japan, right at it, right below it. Now, how can that happen? Man, oh, dude, I could talk for another hour. Electric energy coming up out of the crust. Going up to the power lines. Or maybe coming out of the power lines and going down into the crust. Or both. Maybe going between the crust and the power lines and back down to the crust. And back and forth. Could be. Something is causing earthquakes below the power lines, though, and the power generating stations. That I know for certain. Even in the United States, at the geothermal power plants, at the wind farms. So you can't just say it's from geothermal volcanoes happening at the wind farms too and the power stations going out from that the hydroelectric dams also happening at that and the power lines going out from those locations the solar farms also happening at the solar farms where the solar farms are generating a lot of electricity all of a sudden we get hot spots and earthquakes that break out next to these can't be a coincidence at all of them which means there's a connection between electricity and earthquakes which we already know somewhat earthquake lights the glowing lights that the USGS even shows and talks about from time to time that appear when earth stresses take place. Electrical discharge in the air. Plasma air glow. Think of the northern lights that happens at a lower level. Excited electrons coming up out of the ground, basically. Not heat. Not to the point where it's hot. Although, it can happen where there's seismic release taking place that heat can build up in the crust and friction can be created and heat can be released. A good example of that is the Great New Madrid Earthquake in the United States in 1811-1812 in the middle of winter. Middle of winter, I think it was like end of December, start of January, right after New Year's, maybe January into February. Anyway, 1811-1812, we have the biggest earthquakes in the continental United States history right here. And steam and heat were reported shooting up in jets out of the ground. Not a little bit, but hot steam and uh, also hot mud was reported. And flashing lights in the distance. This is 1811, 1812. No electricity across the area at all of any kind going across any of the area. So for people to see flashes in the middle of the night while the earthquake was happening, earthquake lights... Okay, there we go. And that's from, again, the stresses in the ground and the glow, air glow that happens. It's just amazing. I'm very intrigued by all of this, as you can tell. Hopefully you are too. If you like what I'm doing. Now, with these warnings that I issue, I have family that lives in California, so they will be hearing about this warning that I've issued. If they haven't already, I'll send it to them. But I want you guys to at least watch along with me. You don't exactly have to warn everybody in your family if you don't feel comfortable doing that. But you can watch, and you can let the people you know that live there tell them to be on watch for 5.0 range. And a lot of people in California just kind of shrug their shoulders at fives anyways. Because it's not normally enough to cause major damage, but it's also not enough to totally ignore. Like it'll send you diving underneath your chair. It'll make you get online, and you'll laugh about it when you watch your 
news media people freak out on the desk, underneath their desk and stuff. But it goes just a little bit bigger than that. And all of a sudden you got damage. Collapsed structures just on a hair bigger than that. Just because of the building codes in California, right? So we hope for the best. We hope it stays under that 5.0 threshold. So it's just an oddity for people. But let them know. It's coming. The rest of the state is moving. The plate is shifted. Still shifting slightly, but the rest of the whole Pacific plate is going in that 5, 4, and 5.0 basis with a few 6s. And we're expecting it to go a whole step up in each location as of today, basically. And it is. It's starting to go up a whole step up as of today. And the reason we're looking today is because four days ago on the 10th, when the solar storm arrived, I told you guys it takes a few days, two to three days, for that energy to go down to the core and come back up with the deep earthquake. Now here we are. It's happening. Have an earthquake plan and be prepared just in case. Let's just go quickly check the chat room and say hi to everybody over on Twitch who's watching. Word up and much love to everybody over on Twitch. You're absolutely incredible. Is the USGS truck driving by your house? Oh, they're talking to Yabba. Oh, probably. <laughs> hey, he, he lives in Bedrock, doesn't he? Yabba Dabba do, right? Little Flintstone joke there. Come on. Hey, did you know? Here, a little fun fact. The Flintstones were mud flood giants. Did you know that? They're giants, guys. They're giants. They're the Tartarians, man. All right. Anyway. We're doing good. It is 8.15 p.m. <laughs> Central Time. <laughs> Somebody's like, are you flat Earth? I'm like, oh, uh, Earth is flat all the way around. But I'm bumped. You guys be safe. Now, now, in all seriousness, you need to have an earthquake plan and know what to do just to take shelter. This is so basic, but most people run around and scream earthquake for some reason, at least every video I see. I would say to everybody that the people who are in your household, unless they're little kids, already know that an earthquake is happening. You don't have to run around and scream it, right? Like they're in the next room. They know it's shaking too. So in that few second time that you would take to run around or yell something or grab your phone, you're automatically going to the spot that you know you need to take shelter in because it could just be a matter of seconds before a big arrival time of a, of a large earthquake. You know, it starts shaking just a little bit. You see all these videos. I've never been in an earthquake of any kind, knock on wood. So I wouldn't really know, other than to tell you I've seen enough video of it that first there's like a small arrival of a small wave letting you know something's getting ready to hit you. And then, boom, the big shock wave hits. And by then, people are, that's when the screaming happens and then people start running around. And you would automatically know at that first jolt to be able to go towards your safe location to take shelter from the earthquake underneath a table or a desk. Now, if you're not confident in your structure, this is just something that any person in any construction would tell you. If you don't feel confident in your structure, you need to have a place to go outside in case the structure fails. Basic rule, so make sure you have a place outside pre-designated that you, your family, your friends, whoever you live with, your roommates, your coworkers, if you're at work, and at work is something else to think about because, you know, most of us, uh, well, now I don't know what your deal is with work, with the way things are going in the world. But if you're at your office, you also need to have a plan dealing with that. How are you going to get home? How are you going to get in touch with people? Those are all things you'll take care of. I'm just reminding you. A lot of times, all it takes is just somebody to remind you. Now, the emergency kit, you should have all these things currently in your house. Change of clothes, set of shoes flashlight, batteries, first aid kit, or at least sanitation of some kind, that you would have that all and put it into a bag, ready to go at a moment's notice. And the flashlight and batteries, those are extra things, but you don't want to be using your mobile phone for the flashlight when you're going to need to use that for communication, maybe. So just cover those bases. Just take the extra time to put it together. Oh, extra car keys. Oh my gosh. Car keys, house keys, extra set. And you'll end up using them anyways. When you lose your keys and you can't find them somewhere, you will have the extra set in your emergency kit that you will thank yourself for later on. You can thank me later on for telling you to do that one because I've already used mine a few times. A, a few moments where I'm walking around the house and I'm like, damn it, I can't find my keys. And I'm like, oh yeah, got an extra set in the bug out bag. Bump, bump. And I actually go, look, I'm actually using it. Duchess goes, yeah, yeah, whatever. 
All right, guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. All that planning. Hey, hey. One year ago, I told you all, it was almost exactly a year ago. It was December of 2019. And I told you guys all in December to go stock up and be prepared for all sorts of disasters and emergencies. And I got called a fear monger. I got called this and that. This is December of last year now, right? And by the end of December, start of January, you know what happened then. And just by chance, all my viewers had gone out because of the earthquakes that were striking. All my viewers had gone out, or most of them, and bought some kind of preparation supplies. So when it actually hit the fan in January and February, most of my viewers had a good stockpile of stuff while everybody else was called a hoarder. You remember this? All the regular Joes went out to the store and filled up their carts. You, don't you remember? And what did they call those people? They called those people hoarders. They were running around the store, filling up the cart with everything they like, multiples of everything they like. Why not? And I came up with a joke at that point, which really is not that funny, but it's just a clever little pun, which is what is the difference between a prepper, a person who prepares, and a hoarder? Oh, I'd say about three weeks. That's the joke. So the difference is about two to three weeks. A prepper is somebody who goes and buys multiples of what they want when there's plenty around for everybody. Everybody can go get as much as they want and you go get multiples of what you like. Whatever it is. What you're going to live on for however long. And nobody shames you when you go to the store on a normal day and fill up with what you want. As much as you want. No biggie. But then all of a sudden a disaster happens. And what happens? Oh, you're a hoarder. You're buying too much. You're only allowed two per thing, lady. Um, bah, 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 bah. And they all turn into this craziness because there's not enough for everybody at that one moment when they all run on it. So the difference between a prepper and a hoarder is three weeks. And remember that joke. But it's not really that funny, is it? It's the truth. And nobody could shame us because we were already stocked for other disasters, including fires, earthquakes, floods, natural disasters, civil unrest, which is what we were worried about back in the impeachment time, not because of any craziness, but because of the people that were already out in the streets, destroying everything. You remember that. So, we, we, we were boxing up and preparing because of that. And then next thing you know, everybody else is hitting the stores and the mainstream media started in on telling people that they were bad for stocking up. When we know it's not bad to stock up. So, and then they put rules which wouldn't let you stock up. So, did you learn your lesson from last year? The time now, 8.22 p.m. I'm not trying to be too serious. Dang, man, that got real serious. <laughs> I got real serious real quick. Dang. For crying out loud, how do I get things on a better tone before I get out of here? You want me to do a song and dance? Sing you a Christmas carol? Hey. Have you guys heard my, my Christmas carol? I sang a song for the world a few years ago. It's, it's the 12 days of of conspiracy Christmas the 12 days of conspiracy miss and there's lyrics and you can follow along and copper tropicals my former moderator God bless her heart she dealt with a lot as being a moderator but she also put it together in a video let's see hold on this should be fun let's see if it even comes up you know how YouTube is finicky these days 12 days of conspiracy Christmas. There it is. You ready? <laughs> 